Hello and welcome to the second part of the fourth lecture on this course on chemical process design. This part of this lecture will start by making the assumption that the initial process design for a reactor is complete and that we have some idea about the volume of reactants needed, the type of reactor, the thermal duty and the approximate hydraulic design. Firstly, we'll examine aspects of thermal design. We'll consider means of internal and external heating or cooling for both tank type and tubular type reactors and recognize that the pressure vessel that contains the reaction may well also contain heat transfer equipment. In fact, we'll see that for some types of heat exchange system, the heat exchange design dominates the reactor design. A key learning point will be that the volume of the pressure vessel will be larger, sometimes significantly larger than that required for just the reaction to occur in. We'll go on to briefly examine agitation systems and also mention some other pieces of mechanical equipment that may need to go inside a reactor pressure vessel. So, if you recall where we got to in the last lecture, we had a reactor model. We wrote the model ourselves, or we may have elected to use a model within a flow sheeting package, and that model was able to deliver us some information we were able to ascertain the volume of reactor required for whatever conversion that's going on. And that was probably going to be limited by equilibrium, by rate, or by mass transfer, or sometimes a combination of these things. The other sorts of information we'll find is that we'll know the reactor temperature and the reactor energy requirement. We'll have some estimate of the reactor hydraulics, be that just a pressure drop, or in the case of a multi-phase system, possibly a bubble void fraction, since that's a required piece of information to calculate the mass transfer characteristics. We may also have made the decision as to whether or not the system requires agitation or mixing. If, for example, you have a solid liquid or a solid liquid gas system, then we know that we don't want the solids to settle out and that there is a minimum suspension criterion that we need to achieve in order to prevent that from happening. So our reactor model will give us a great deal of information. However, never assume that your job is done once you have your reactor model, because as a chemical engineer, you are not delivering some nice modeling data. You are delivering a design for a vessel that has to be built. Okay. So, as you can see from this picture on the board, the ultimate vessel is a rather different beast to just a model output. There's a heck of a lot more to do to arrive at that initial vessel design. So, we need to think now in detail about the heat transfer design. We need to think in detail about the mixing design and whether we need mixing. We need to think what other internal equipment may appear inside our reactor. It could be mechanical supports for catalyst beds, it could be flow distribution systems. We need to think about the design of the pressure vessel itself. How does it connect to the outside world in terms of the process, in terms of the control and instrumentation, in terms of draining and venting and pressure relief? So there's a lot to think about there. If we've got an agitated vessel, how does the agitator actually go in the vessel and what mechanical seals are needed, what gearboxes are needed and what motors are needed? And then there's the control of the entire piece of equipment. We may have designed our pressure vessel to allow instruments to be attached, but what's the control system design looking like? How are we actually going to determine how to add heat or when to let in or remove reactants in a batch system? So all this design, of course, has to address safety first and foremost. We'll then worry about cost. We'll find also that the design process can be somewhat iterative. So let's start by thinking about heat exchange design. I've put a few key questions on the whiteboard for you to think about. The first is how much thermal energy is transferred and at what temperature? Second, is heat transfer to the reactants or from the reactants? Thirdly, are your heat exchange devices going to be internal or are they going to be external? So all of these things can be done, but let's start by thinking about the temperature of the heat and how it's going to be supplied and removed. Now, don't forget that heat is sometimes or usually supplied by a utility of some sort or by feed effluent heat exchange. Let's think about the utilities that we can use to provide heat to start with. And the first thing that people tend to forget is temperature approach. You've got a hot utility. You're using it to heat up a mixture of cooler gases or liquids. Those gases or liquids that are cool will never attain the temperature of the utility. And we need to remember the difference between that utility temperature and the hottest that we can get our reactants, and we call this our temperature approach. Conservatively, you might aim for a temperature approach of about 20 degrees C. 
you'll find that some utilities and some systems will allow a far tighter temperature approach, maybe as low as 5 degrees C, but if you start at 20, then you can get a fairly good idea of a robust design and how it's going to work. So let's consider what utilities can give us heat. Let's think about steam systems to start with, since they are almost ubiquitous on plant. You'll find steam at different pressures, typically low pressure, intermediate pressure and high pressure. A typical low pressure steam might be at 5 bar absolute. So if you go to your steam tables and look up the boiling point of water at 5 bar, it's 159 degrees C. So if we have saturated 5 bar steam, you can heat to maybe 140 degrees C. If you're boiling 5 bar water to produce 5 bar steam by getting rid of an exotherm, you can cool to possibly 180 degrees C. In a similar vein, if we think about intermediate pressure steam or intermediate pressure water, you'll find that the boiling point at 15 bar is just a touch over 200 degrees C. So you can heat to 180 or cool to 220. Likewise, for high pressure steam, typically 40 bar or thereabouts, the boiling point of water at 40 bars, 252 degrees C. So you can heat to 230 or cool to 270. Now steam is by far the preferred means of heating um, and if your temperatures in your system are at a maximum of about 230 you can get away with up to 40 bar steam. If you need to hot heat to hotter than 230 degrees C then you need to consider a heat transfer fluid of some sort. So you'll find there's a whole range of different heat transfer fluids on the market used for both heating and for cooling. Now, looking through the various manufacturer specifications, the heat transfer fluid that allows you to heat the hottest is Dowtherm A, and you can heat to about 380 degrees C using Dowtherm A, and you'd heat the Dowtherm in a furnace. As a cooling fluid, you can use Siltherm XLT, and that will allow you to cool to about minus 80, which is a lot lower than, say, some of the brine systems that you may commonly find. If you need to get heat at a higher temperature than around 380, 400 degrees C, then you have to go, to go for a furnace. And so furnaces will allow you to heat up to maybe 1000 degrees C, and radiative heat transfer accounts to probably up to 70% of the heat transfer that's used. And of course, if you're using a hot heat transfer liquid like Dowtherm, that will be, have to be heated in a furnace first. Now, let's now think about what heat exchange configurations might exist for tubular reactors. So I'm going to put three pictures on the whiteboard for you. The first looks incredibly like a shell and tube heat exchanger. We have hot fluid coming in on the bottom left hand side. We have cold fluid going out on the top right hand side. So this fluid is circulating around the shell. The reactants are going through tube side and those tubes may or may not be packed with catalyst depending on the system that's being used. Now, the first thing to think about is safety. And the first thing I would think about in this case is what happens if you get one of your reactant tubes breaching? What happens if your reactant hits water? Is there a catastrophic reaction that happens? In which case you need to make sure that never occurs. You also will find that your heat transfer volume is significant here. So does this additional heat transfer area and volume that it takes up make this design inherently unsafe? So we need to be careful. So if we're thinking about the heat transfer coefficients that can be achieved, if you're using Dowtherm heating a gas, then you might achieve somewhere in the window of 20 to 200 watt per square meter Kelvin. If you're using steam heating a gas, it's kind of similar, somewhere in the window of 30 to 300 watts per square meter Kelvin. If you think back to the ammonia example, we saw that what we had was an integrated system where we had packed beds and tube bundles all in the same pressure vessel. And so the second diagram is kind of similar to that. What we have is a tube bundle within our pressure vessel, but this time rather than taking the effluent of the reactor, it's taking an external utility. And then we have a second tube bundle that will be removing reactant exotherm. And again, that's illustrated with a um, external utility providing the heat transfer. So again, first thing to think about here is safety. We're using an external utility. What happens if you get a tube breach and you get the reacting mixture contacting the utility or the utility contacting the catalyst? Is there a scenario here that you just don't want to happen? And is there a very good safety reason why you shouldn't be doing this? Can the design be achieved in another way in that case? Can we abstract the design concept? Remember that ammonia reactor didn't use an external utility 
for heating or cooling. It just got rid of the reaction exotherm by clever mechanical design and positioning of equipment within the pressure vessel. So if we think about heat transfer coefficients, if you're using steam with an aqueous mixture, you might get 500 to 700 watt per square meter Kelvin. If you're using steam heating or cooling organics, you might get 250 to 500 watt per square meter Kelvin. Okay, if we need high temperatures, then we said we need to go down the route of a fired heater or furnace. Now, safety here is absolutely paramount. Furnaces are not inherently safe pieces of equipment. They involve typically a gas burner, lots of flames, lots of radiant heat, and so much so there are dedicated exclusion zones around fired heaters in which you must not place other items of process equipment. So not only will a fired heater have an impact on the safety of your plant, it will also have a significant impact on the layout of your plant. And this is an example of where heat transfer design dominates the unit operation. A good example of a chemical reaction taking place in a fired, heat, fired heater would be methane steam reforming. You have reformer tubes in a whopping great furnace lined with refractory, and it is the heat transfer and the furnace that takes the majority of the space up in that design. We're no longer talking about um, heat um, sort of heat transfer coefficients in watts per square meter Kelvin. We're talking about overall heat fluxes. So for a steam methane reformer, you might be looking at about 47 kilowatts per meter squared. And for a glycol heater that you might use, for example, for heating Dowtherm, you're looking at about 23 and a half kilowatt per square meter. Now, let's think about heat exchange configurations for tank type reactors. So here on the whiteboard, I've put an illustration of one such device. We've got an external heating jacket. So we have our reacting mixture completely segregated from our heat transfer. So from a safety standpoint, this could be quite useful. Now, also the heat transfer doesn't add to the reactor volume because the jacket is around the pressure vessel rather than internal to the pressure vessel. So there's two safety features here that look quite nice. However, the downside is that the heat transfer can be quite compromised. Your reactor vessel might actually be a lined vessel. If you've got a particularly nasty corrosive mixture, for example, you might have glass lined the vessel or possibly epoxy or rubber lined the vessel. And of course that adds on extra thermal resistance to the heat transfer coming from an external jacket. And so you've got a conundrum to think about here in terms of the effectiveness of the heat transfer vis-a-vis -vis what's actually required for the system and to keep safety levels high. Typical heat transfer coefficients for steam to an aqueous reacting mixture you're looking between 500 and 700 watt per square meter kelvin, steam to organics 250 to 500 watt per square meter kelvin. Of course if you want to estimate the heat transfer coefficient more accurately then you can use a formula such as the following. And what this is doing is examining the reactor as a cylindrical system and saying, well, OK, the reciprocal of the product of heat transfer coefficient times area is going to be equal to a sum of terms. And these terms are effectively the set of heat transfer resistances from the bulk utility fluid into the bulk reacting mixture. And so here you've got the area of the inner heat transfer surface the area of the heat outer heat transfer surface, various fouling coefficients, very, very important to forget that heat transfer is never going to be perfect, and then thermal conduction um, through the various cylindrical parts of the reacting system. Now, there are various correlations you can use to find out what your film heat transfer coefficients are. So, for example, for viscous liquids, there's a correlation here, a Nusselt number correlation, that gives you your film heat tra transfer coefficient, which is alpha zero. And you'll find that the constants in this depend on the type of reacting medium you've got, varying from 0.027 for a viscous liquid to 0.021 for a gas. So relatively easy to get a rough approximation because C doesn't vary a great deal. If you've got an agitated system, again, different correlations will apply, and I've put a second Nusselt number correlation here on the board for you that allows you to calculate the inner film resistance due to a stirred tank. There's a lot more of these correlations in the literature, and if you look at Towler and Sinnott's excellent book on chemical engineering design, pages 941 to 943, you'll see far more listed.
If we think about the different configurations, in addition to having an external jacket, you could have internal heating coils. Now here we're back to the scenario where you do have your heat transfer equipment taking up uh, pressure vessel volume, and you also have the safety worry about what happens if you get a coil breach. Again, if you get your reactant contacting your utility, what happens not only within the reactor, but in terms of upstream and downstream equipment as well, bearing in mind that your utility and your reactor may be at different pressure levels. And we'll be talking more about that when we talk about pressure safety in a future lecture. The advantage of having a coil inside your reactor, of course, is higher heat transfer. And so if you again, you're having steam contacting an aqueous mixture, you can get almost double what you might expect from an external heating jacket, 800 to 1500 watt per square meter Kelvin. And again, steam to organics, you're only still getting about 300 to 500 watt per square meter Kelvin. You may elect, of course, not to put heat exchange equipment in your reactor pressure vessel at all. You may elect to have an external shell and tube heat exchanger. And if you need higher heat transfer coefficients, this is what you might consider. Again, from a safety standpoint, you've got additional pieces of equipment. Um, it depends on the pressure level of the system. Um, if all this is operating at fairly low pressure, then the additional items of equipment don't pose a pressure hazard. You've got additional flanges and additional possibility for leaks, but that's something else to manage. If we have a look at those heat transfer coefficients, again, we can see that there may be three times or more compared to an external jacket. So steam on aqueous, 1500 to 4000 watt per square meter Kelvin, and steam and organics, 400 to 950 watt per square meter Kelvin. So heating systems aren't the only items of equipment that may take up space within your reactor pressure vessels. We've considered scenarios where agitation and mixing is going to be important, for example, if you have suspended solids. And so the agitation system that you design will depend on the type of mixing that you want and also what you've got in your reactor in terms of the viscosity of the medium. So if you look in a lot of the chemical engineering texts, and again, I would refer you very happily to Towler and Sinnott's excellent book on chemical engineering design published by Elsevier, you'll find selection charts. And I've sketched a selection chart on the whiteboard here for you. And what this allows you to do is to match the appropriate agitation technology in this case to your tank volume and your fluid mechanics of your liquid system. So for example, there'll be ranges where you might specify a propeller type agitator, viscosity ranges and volumes where you might specify a turbine type agitator, a paddle type agitator, or something slightly more specialist like an anchor or maybe even a disc plate type reacting system. And so getting a very clear idea about what each of these mixing systems entails is again another very important element of how you start to evolve your mechanical design of your process. Now. With all mechanical equipment, don't forget that you're going to have seals and bearings and supports that are needed around the agitation system. If you imagine you've got your agitator connected to a vertical shaft, that vertical shaft goes through the wall of the pressure vessel. How do you prevent what's in the pressure vessel leaking out through that um, part where the agitator comes in? So you're going to have a, a suitable seal there, a suitable bearing such that the agitator can actually rotate or it might be a bushing, it depends on the system. And that within the vessel itself, you need to promote mixing a little bit more. It's very rare to have an agitator and nothing else. You'll typically have some baffles within the vessel, which are sort of longitudinal ridges running along your vessel to help enhance the flow patterns. Now, when you've got agitation systems, these are of course mechanical items of equipment that move, don't overlook maintenance. Um, can you actually take the lid off this reactor and inspect the agitators, replace the bearings, replace seals, and so on and so forth? So again, when it comes to thinking about the mechanical embodiment of your process equipment, pay close attention to how agitation systems actually are designed. So let's briefly think about other things that you might expect to find inside a reactor pressure vessel. You might find supports are required for various items of equipment you've already specified, such as catalyst beds or heat exchange elements. You might also see that you've got a solid gas reaction, and a very good example of this is fluid catalytic cracking, where solids can be carried out 
within the reacting gas, which is something that you do not want to happen. And so disengagement equipment such as cyclones have to be placed within the pressure vessel to ensure that your solids and your gases are separate from one another. And if you look in the top of a fluid catalytic cracker, you'll find 10, 20 cyclones take up quite a significant bit of space. If you've got a gas-liquid reaction, a similar thing might happen. You might want to prevent aerosol, liquid aerosol, carry over into the gas phase outlet. And so it's not uncommon to have things like demisting pads to help achieve that aim. If you've got a multi-phase gas-liquid system, of course you've got to get your gas into the reacting liquid, and typically sparging equipment or other means of introducing gas into the liquid will be needed. And of course all these things take up space within the reactor pressure vessel, which affects the pressure vessel volume, which can have an effect on its safety and wall thickness, and hence its ease and cost of fabrication. So there's a lot of things to think about when transitioning from a nice process simulation through to the first pass of a mechanical design. So let's recap a few points. We've seen that from your process simulation stage, you'll know something about your reactor volume, your energy requirements, and maybe some estimates of hydraulic parameters such as pressure drop or bubble void fraction. Hopefully, what I wanted to illustrate is that transitioning to a mechanical design requires a lot more engineering input over and above what you've done for just the process design. Heat exchange design we examined in quite some detail. It can be anywhere in terms of a small impact, an external heat exchanger for a CSTR, for example, at low pressure, to dominating the design, for example, a methane steam reformer. If agitators are required, then your choice of agitator is again driven by characteristics of your reaction, your liquid viscosity and the volume of your reactor. And again, it can have anywhere from quite a small impact on how you would design your reactor, for example, a propeller type agitator plus baffles, through to dominating the reactor design. For example, for some polymerization reactors, you have disc ring reactors, very, very high viscosity, very limited mass transfer, and it is the disc ring reactor mechanics that actually dominate the reactor design in that case. So, remember to allow space. Space for heat transfer equipment, space for agitation equipment, space for other supporting equipment as well.